What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Pats podcast. I'm Phil Perry coming at you from Radio Row at Super Bowl 58 in Las Vegas. We're going to have so much content for you this week when it comes to finding out what is next for this Patriots franchise. Free agency, the draft, on the coaching staff, and in the front office. And today, we are going to focus on the draft specifically with Eric Eager, friend of the podcast, Eric Eager, VP of Research and Development at Sumer Sports, where they are blending data and football. Thomas Dimitrov is the CEO there, former general manager of the Atlanta Falcons, college scouting director for your New England Patriots. And Eric is tremendous when it comes to the various options that the Patriots have. We're going to be looking at the two teams involved in this Super Bowl, how they built up their rosters to get to the game that everybody is trying to get to, Patriots included. Where does the quarterback come in? Do you build up the roster first, add the quarterback later, or vice versa? I think you're going to find Eric's answer interesting because when you think of data people, and Eric is a data person, you think of the value of the quarterback position and all that you might be missing if you pass on a quarterback at number three overall. But in our conversation, he suggests trading down for New England specifically. He's going to tell you why. I want you to come at this conversation with an open mind. Here it is right now, Eric Eager from Sumer Sports. Very happy now to have with us Eric Eager, VP of Research and Development at Sumer Sports, friend of the Next Pats podcast. We've had you on before, Eric. Thanks for being back with us. Hey, thanks for having me. I want to ask you about the two teams in this week's game, the Niners and the Chiefs, because from a Patriots perspective, we're looking at a roster that needs a complete overhaul. Yep. And so the question is, how do you approach the rebuild? Do you go after, for instance, the Chiefs model, where you try to build up the roster, eventually find the great quarterback, move heaven and earth to make sure you get him? Or do you go with the Niners model, which is, again, build up the roster, but to really an incredible degree, to the point where you could drop a seventh round pick in it and have him perform the way Brock Purdy has performed. What do you think is the more repeatable model? I think it just depends upon what your goals are because they both kind of did the same thing. In 2013, Andy Reid took over a 2-14 and team with Romeo Cornell and, and Scott Pioli, you know, former Patriots executive, and they went the two second-round picks for Alex Smith. They kind of built the roster that way. There weren't quarterbacks in that draft, so that was kind of out of necessity. Um, and then they kind of just waited, right? Alex Smith was good enough to get them to – you know, kind of the two or three seed every single year, but every single playoff was kind of disappointing. Um, they were not nearly as good as the San Francisco team kind of in the premium position spots, uh, but they weren't also, you know, they were waiting. And then eventually they had the, the courage of conviction to get Patrick Mahomes and the rest is history. Uh, I think that San Francisco, when they started over, it was in the Mahomes draft. Everybody gives the Bears a lot of flack, but it really, the, that Niners team passed on Mahomes and went kind of in the, in the conservative route with the quarterback position. But the funny part about San Francisco is because of the way they're constructed, every single year they're losing 10 games or in the conference championship. So you look at their roster and it's Nick Bose is the second overall pick. Eric Armstead's a top pick. And so they're, they're kind of the Kansas City Chiefs have three top 20 picks on their whole roster, and two of them don't play, Blaine Gabbard and Kadarius Toney. The only other one is Patrick Mahomes. The Niners kind of go after these blue chip players. So for, which one's better? I think having the quarterback is maybe more resilient. You look at the Niners, I think the bill is going to become due. But the hard part is, is people are so – it's so hard – to find a quarterback of Patrick Mahomes' caliber that I think if I were prescribing a solution to the Patriots, I'd probably prescribe the Niners one. So it's interesting now. They have the third pick then. What does that mean you would do with that pick? Do you do you take the quarterback, no questions asked, because it does look like a three-quarterback yep. draft, quote-unquote? Or do you move down, stockpile assets, try to build up the roster, and drop the quarterback in later? I think you. if I were in charge, I'd trade down just because – you know, Jaden Daniels is phenomenal as far as a prospect, but there are some concerns, you know, pressure to sack ratio. Like, sack avoidance is the number one. You look at Patrick Mahomes, down year statistically. He averaged three yards fewer per attempt than Brock Purdy did this year, but he was second in the NFL in sack avoidance to Josh Allen. Josh Allen would be second in MVP voting this year. And so Jaden Daniels, he took a sack on 20% of pressures this year, 30% last year for LSU, and that's something that carries. And so when you think about the Patriots having to rebuild the offensive line, having to rebuild the receiving core, when you have a quarterback that struggles with pressure, struggles when, a, when the wide receivers aren't open, and a, 
that's going to be hard to build an offense around. We saw it in Washington with Sam Howell. That's another guy with a high pressure to sack ratio. For young quarterbacks, it's just not conducive to success. So unless they can go up and get Williams, go up and get May, I just don't think that it's a good gamble for them. And so I think moving back, and you know, you could end up with a player like Bo Nix, you can end up with a player like Michael Penix. Michael Penix, by the way, under 10% of his pressures as a college quarterback turned into sacks. So that's a guy with quick processing uh, and, and could do that, even in an offense where you're kind of building up the line or something like that. So I would prescribe a trade, a trade back because there are going to be a lot of teams in a down year offensively in the NFL that are going to be desperate for a quarterback. It's a fascinating stat that you have there on Daniels because he obviously is an incredible athlete. Yep. And he is typically, it looks like, a scramble-to-run player, not a scramble-to-throw player, which might speak to what you're saying. Even if he does scramble to throw, some of those plays might result in sacks. They might result in the negative plays that we're talking about. Is Drake May at all similar? Does he have, uh, is there a difference in his game that might make him more attractive to the Patriots? So he and Williams are both kind of in that 15 to 20 ratio, so a little bit lower. It's still concerned. Like, I'd rather it be kind of in that 10 to 15 mm. or 5 to 10 percent range. Both of those guys are a little bit better. I think both the guys, when you think about like arm talent, are better. So it's all about, when you think about quarterbacks, it's all about looking at that metric tree and then looking at the stability of them. Like, you know, deep passing is a great trait to have. It doesn't translate all that well from college to pro, but you'd like to have it. Drake May has it. Caleb Williams has it. Sack avoidance is an incredibly stable statistic. You'd like to have it, right? So I, I think that, you know, Jaden Daniels is a guy who has a lot of those traits, but in some of the ones that are more sticky, he's a little bit weaker. That's interesting. So might be a godsend for the Patriots if Drake May gets past the second pick because it does sound as yeah. though, Eric, there are NFL teams that value Jaden Daniels ahead of Drake May. It sounds like there's a little bit of a split there. Yeah, and I think the athleticism is the big thing, but you just you described it perfectly. In the NFL, those things close up really quickly. And we even saw this with Lamar Jackson, who I, I hate to talk disparagingly because he's going to win the MVP, but you even saw it in the conference championship game when he broke free. Four or five years into his career, he's not as explosive as he once was. And when you're buying into that, the otherworldly athleticism, it all, it's a, for a flicker of time. And, and so e even as he develops as a passer, those, those tan, you know, tangential things go away, and you're going to really want to have a guy who it, you know, has those other tools in addition to the athleticism. And I think teams are a little over-indexing on that pure running ability for quarterbacks right now. Let's play the game then. Say they trade down. That's the plan that you prescribe. Are the hit rates, from what you have seen and what you've observed, are the hit rates that much better at a different position? Say they end up taking yeah. a tackle at eight versus a quarterback at three. Are they much more likely to get a great tackle at that spot than they are a great quarterback at three overall? Uh, it's not really because of the payoff at quarterback. Like when you hit on a quarterback, they end up being about four times more valuable. So as far as like expected value, it's better to go for quarterback. For me, though, it's can you look at the this roster and say this guy's going to be successful and it's just rare when you like Andrew Luck in, in in Indianapolis was a guy that was overcoming a lot of stuff I mean Patrick Mahomes the guy that's playing quarterback in this game that you know Eric Fisher was a number one pick Mitchell Schwartz was a great you know a Hall of Fame caliber tackle Tyree Kill Travis Kelsey he's great but he wasn't a uh, he was not one man right it was it was a lot of stuff this Patriots team especially offensively they need wide receivers they need offensive line they need tight ends they need a great play caller and I just I worry about the third best quarterback in this draft being able to be successful in that system whereas I see a tackle being kind of that guy where you know all these teams that they if you allow these teams to go and take these five quarterbacks in this draft they're not going to take one next year and you might be in a situation a la Belichick when he was starting out. Remember Belichick, the reason he ran the four, the three four was no one wanted Ted Washington. No one wanted the nose. Right. Like you, next year these teams, there may be fewer quarterbacks, but there are also going to be fewer teams who prize quarterbacks because they're all going to take them this year. And so I think that that might be the the benefit where you might get the best quarterback next year, whereas you're gonna you're gonna have to settle for the third best this year. Right. Might have to play the long game. Yeah. I want to see if I can get you on board with a with a. An approach that I've been kicking around, we've been workshopping this, Eric, okay? Now, as a media person, I, of course, would love it if the local team took a quarterback because it just infuses yeah, excitement course. and storylines into our market. So that's number one. But say they don't love one of these quarterbacks who could fall to them at three. What would you call a plan that would call for the Patriots trading a third-round pick for Justin Fields, who we know only has one year yep. left on his contract right now, and then going with some of these other positions, first and second round, to try to build up the roster and just at the same time 
seeing if there's still any value there in a former first round pick in fields. Yeah, you'd have to do it fairly quickly because the fifth year option, like you'd have to make a decision on him, right? Because of the fifth year option. Uh, the only hard part is that fields, you know, in Chicago, the positivity about fields is almost entirely because of this lack of support. And in New England, he's going to have a similar issue. And so that's like my only my only hesitation. But he's been able to make something out of nothing a lot. So that could be a, a good thing. Um, yeah, I don't hate it. And, and a third round pick, I think his market is going to be more of a second. And I don't know if the Bears, like I think the Bears are going to take Williams or May. And I think they're going to keep Fields for the Sam Bradford type of trade. You know, you remember in 2016, the Eagles traded up to two, took Wentz, held on to Bradford, and then when Teddy Bridgewater tore out his knee, he got a first round pick for Bradford. Right. You think about this year, the number of teams that at the trade deadline needed quarterback play, I think that that's going to ultimately be when, when Ryan Poles is like, do I trade you know Fields for a second or a third right now? I think he's going to say, well, why don't I keep the guy here? Because inevitably, Aaron Rodgers might get hurt or something like that might happen, and I've got a team that's desperate you know, to keep their job and is going to want to bring a guy in. And by then, you can get a first-rounder for him. When we talk about these draft picks at quarterback this year, is anything that you have looked at pertinent when it comes to how these guys might perform in bad weather? Because the options we think the Patriots will have would be Drake May, Jane Daniels, maybe some of the second-round quarterbacks yep. that are in the mix as well, or later first-round guys. Is anyone in that mix a bad weather quarterback? Because we know that's when the Patriots, you would think, play their most important games is December or January. Yeah, we don't have any measurements, but like I do think one of the biggest L's the analytics community took was Josh Allen, when you looked at his college data, you know, we we were good enough at adjusting for that, right? The weather, you know, you can actually tie to it, wind and all that stuff. But the traits, right? You look at Joe Burrow, who in my opinion is a phenomenal quarterback. I think he's always, in my mind, going to be a little bit of a step below Herbert, Allen, Mahomes, because when he's injured, he's just a little worse. And so when I look at quarterbacks sometimes now, I look at the physical traits matter in overcoming weather and injuries. And I think, you know, Williams has a lot of great, he's a rubbery arm and all this. He's, a, he's under six feet. I mean, he's going to come in under six feet. I think that there's some things, you know, to that. Uh, I think Daniels is kind of thin, right? He kind of reminds me, from a, a build standpoint, of Jim McMahon, who was a, a real, it was a winner, but he never played 16 games for the Bears. He never played in that, you know, he never was able to, uh, after that Super Bowl win, start a whole season. I look at Drake May from a from a size perspective. You saw him on the side of that basketball game in UNC. I, I think size to me is the biggest thing for injuries, but also weather. And, and that's why Josh Allen, I know the Bills haven't won the ultimate game yet, but it's why the Bills are in it every single year and are resilient to all the perturbations in football, which is weather, which is injuries. The guy never misses a game. He, you never see that big of a drop in his play. It's because he has that physical gift, and that's you know it takes it back to the old school scouting where you know you do really want to have that big physical quarterback because when the injuries come inevitably, and when the weather is bad, you need a guy that's going to be able to rip a ball through you know that tough weather and 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 within injuries to his body. It's a fascinating answer that you give because you're right. It does marry old school football yeah. philosophy with the data. You have a wider margin for error. If you're bigger, stronger, you can work through a thumb injury or a yeah. calf injury, or you can cut it through a 25 mile, mile an hour wind. Yeah, Justin Herbert played all of the 2022 season with broken ribs. And no, and you know, it was more legitimate than everybody was saying. And now, granted, they were not the best team in the league, but he got them to 10 and seven in a playoff berth playing through that because he's just more physically gifted. Now, he didn't play the greatest, but I guarantee you some of these less physically gifted quarterbacks who are accurate and all this, Joe Burrow is probably not playing as well as Herbert with the same injury because he's just simply not as big, fast, and strong as Justin is. Last question I wanted to ask you, Eric, because you are doing great work at Sumer now with Thomas Dimitrov, we're about to talk to for the Patriots Talk podcast, and providing us in the media, fans, data that is helping us understand the game a little bit better you were formerly of pro football focus there are two coaches formerly of pro football focus that are very much in the public eye now bobby sloak's getting head coaching interviews after one great year as offensive coordinator he spent time at pff zach robinson former patriots seventh round draft pick zach robinson also spent time at pff now an offensive coordinator himself what do 
what does the success that these guys are having say about how the game, maybe owners even specifically, are embracing data and its usage, not just in the front office, but on the sidelines too? Yeah, I also, it, it, to me it's also a great point about where analytics really we're the point where analytics really wants to be a part of football. Like I think PFF did a great job of looking. Bobby Slowick is Bob Slowick's son, right? The former, you know, he was a defensive coordinator in the NFL, Packers, and PFF like built up all this data, but knew they needed some credibility. You know, Bobby Slowick comes in and builds out the grading system and gives it credibility. And now, you know, part of being a great coach. And part of being a great analyst and a great GM is having a process in place and being able to grade players. And when the, you have the ups and downs, when you have to start Case Keenum because you know CJ Stroud is hurt, being able to deal with those ups and downs, that's to me when I see Slowick, I see that. Zach Robinson, you know, yeah, I, I spent more time working with him because that our, our paths intersected more. It's just a brilliant player, you know, and, and one of the things was so great was he never really, he never played a snap in the NFL. He was around guys like Sean Hill. He was around guys like Stafford. He was, he, he took so many notes uh, uh, and, and took in so many things. A humble guy, you know, but <laughs> you play one game of flag football with him, you realize, oh my God, this guy was truly talented. And you're like, and you, you think about a guy truly talented, but knows the difference between him and some of the guys he's analyzing. The, the guy between him and the guy he's going to be coaching, I, I was always so impressed with how intelligent Zach was and being able to incorporate the data, but understand the football, what to what to really latch on to, what kind of questions. I always judge football people by the kind of questions they ask me, and and Zach always had the best questions, and I think that that really bodes well for him in Atlanta because you know I think that the big reason Atlanta struggled this year was I, I thought Arthur Smith had all Arthur Smith had a lot more answers than he had questions, and I think that sometimes in football. The, 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 the wisdom is in the questions and not the answers. It's a really interesting point. It would be fascinating to see if the Patriots, Eric, embrace analytics a little bit more than they have now that Bill Belichick has moved on. We'll have to wait and see on that. Eric Eager, Sumer Sports, thank you so much for being with us, making us smarter, man. Hey, Appreciate thanks for having me. Great stuff there from Eric, and I, I love talking about all the different scenarios that we could piece together. The most recent mock draft that we built for NBCSportsBoston.com does include a trade down. It includes a trade of a third round pick for Justin Fields because the Patriots, and we're not sure where they are on this quarterback class just yet, but there is the potential for them to look at this class, especially the top three guys, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and say, not the right time for us to invest in one of these guys. Or maybe they look at each individual player's skill set and say, uh, I know the rest of the world thinks that these guys have franchise quarterback potential, but we're not necessarily believers. If that happens, then maybe something like a trade for Fields and then a trade down where you add a tackle and then you've got draft capital to be able to add a receiver later or vice versa. Maybe that's the way to go. But I think having this conversation with Eric early in the process and understand how he's coming at it from an analytical perspective is really, really valuable to us. We are, of course, going to have valuable conversations for you all week long here on Radio Row, on Next Pats, on the Patriots Talk podcast as well. You can find our entire conversation with Thomas Dimitrov, again, CEO of Sumer Sports, with Tom Curran and myself over on Patriots Talk very, very soon if it's not live already. So keep an eye out for that as well. We've been coming at you from Radio Row just about every day. Early edition Boston Sports tonight. We'll be making appearances on the Radio 98.5 The Sports Hub. Zolak and Bertrand, Felger and Maz. Keep it locked right here on Next Pats. We'll have all the info your heart desires.